أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We reached ayah number 27 of Surah At-Tawbah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Then thereafter God will pardon whomsoever he will and God is forgiving and all merciful If you remember my dear brothers and sisters in our last session we spoke at length about one of the most important battles in the history of Islam, which was the final battle that was led by the Holy Prophet and the Holy Prophet actively fought in, which was the Battle of Hunayn. And this was a battle in which, for the first time in the history of Islam, the Muslim army greatly outnumbered their enemies. The Muslims were 12,000 and the enemies from the tribe of Thaqif and Hawazin, they numbered approximately 4,000. And we mentioned that in this battle, the battle took place in the valley of Hunayn and the massive army of the Holy Prophet was, was traveling through a mountain pass and at the break of dawn, Thaqif and Hawazin, they initiated a surprise attack on the Muslim army. And it resulted in the retreat of many of the companions. The majority of the companions retreated in that battle, creating a stampede. And the Prophet was left with only a handful of soldiers. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here says, now, there are two groups who may have made Tawbah in the Battle of Hunayn. Some of them could have been the enemies of the Prophet, members of the tribe of Thaqif and Hawazin, who were initially enemies and Perhaps they wanted to join Islam, they wanted to convert. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that even if someone from the enemies, someone who is a fierce enemy, like the members of Thaqif and Hawazin, if they are willing to repent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will even accept their repentance. Even though they have committed the greatest crime, which is to physically fight the Holy Prophet in the battlefield, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still leaves the door of Tawbah open for them. And also we can say that this Tawbah could also be offered to the companions who retreated but then came back. You see brothers and sisters in the battle of Hunayn, there were three groups the companions of the Prophet can be placed in one of three groups. Either they remained alongside the Prophet, even in the heat of the battle, even when everyone else was retreating. For these people, there was no need for them to repent. There was no sin that was committed. The likes of Ali ibn Abi Talib and some of the close members of Bani Hashim, who never abandoned their posts, who did not retreat, who did not flee. And then you have the remaining two categories, which are the Muslims who fled and did not return. And then you have those who fled, who ran away, and then they came back. They came back to support the Holy Prophet. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثُمَّ يَتُوبُ اللَّهُ مِنْ بَعْدِ, من بعد ذَلِكَ عَلَى مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رحيم. So pardon is given to those who fled and came back, and even those who did not come back. If later on they sincerely repented, the gate of repentance is always open. And if you look at the word yatubu in this ayah, yatubu here is a present tense verb, which means that the door of tawbah is always open. When a present tense verb is used, it denotes continuity, meaning that this gate of repentance is always open. It's never too late to repent. 
there's a hadith from the Holy Prophet speaking about this idea of repentance. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi says, Man taba ila Allahi qabla mawtihi bisana taba Allahu alayhi. The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi says, he who, he who repents to his Lord one year before his death, Allah will accept his repentance. So imagine someone lives for 80 years and this person has sinned for 79 of those years or 70 of those years when they became Baalid or 65. And then in the last year of their lives, they reform themselves. They rectify their relationship with Allah. The Prophet says Allah will accept their tawbah. And then the Prophet, he says, وَقَالَ أَلَا وَسَنَةٌ كَثِيرٌ The Prophet says, in fact, a year is too much. Rasulullah says, مَنْ تَابَ إِلَى اللَّهِ قَبْلَ مَوْتِهِ بِشَهْرٌ تَابَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ The Prophet says, in fact, if someone repents one month before their death, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept their repentance. So imagine someone sins and transgresses and one month, 30 days before their death, they make tawbah and they change their lives. Allah will accept their repentance. And then the Prophet, he says, وَقَالَ شَهْرٌ كَثِيرٌ The Prophet says, even one month is too much. Rasulullah says, مَنْ تَابَ إِلَى اللَّهِ قَبْلَ مَوْتِهِ بِجُمْعَةٍ تَابَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ The Prophet says, if someone, in fact, if someone makes tawbah one Friday before their death, meaning one week before their death, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept their repentance. And then the Prophet says, وَجُمُعَةٌ كَثِيرٌ even a week is too much. Rasulullah says, Man taba ila Allahi qabla mawtihi bisa'a taba Allahu alayhi. The Prophet says, in fact, if someone repents one hour before their death, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept their tawbah. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, even one hour is too much. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, Man taba ila Allah qabla mawtihi qabla an yugharghir. Qabla an yugharghir bil mawt taba Allahu alayhi. The Prophet says, in fact, if someone makes tawbah before the gargling sound, that they make before they die, when the soul passes their throat, Allah will accept their tawbah. The gate of repentance is always open. It's open to those who fought Rasulullah in Hunayn from the tribes of Thaqif and Hawazin. If they repent, Allah will accept their repentance. For the ones who ran away in the battlefield, if they sincerely repent, Allah will accept their repentance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so forgiving. Wallahu ghafoorun rahim. The word ghafoor means the one who regular, regularly forgives. You know, ghafir means the one who forgives. But ghafoor is the exaggerated form, which means the one who forgives once and twice and three times and continuously forgives. Wallahu ghafoorun rahim. Allah is oft forgiving and He is merciful. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns to the believers. Allah now addresses the mu'mineen directly. In ayah number 28, Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu إِنَّمَا الْمُشْرِكُونَ نَجَسٌ فَلَا يَقْرَبُ الْمَسْجِدَ الْحَرَامِ بَعْدَ عَامِهِمْ هَذَا 
وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ عَيْلَةً فَسَوْفَ يُغْنِيكُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ إِنْ شَاءَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O you who believe, the idolaters, the mushrikeen, are surely unclean. So let them not come near the sacred mosque after this year of theirs. If you fear poverty, Allah is addressing the mu'mineen. If you fear poverty, God will enrich you from his bounty, if he will. Truly God is knowing and wise. Now if you remember, brothers and sisters, when we first began our discussion on Surah at tawbah we mentioned that Surah at tawbah was delivered in the hands of Abu Bakr initially. Rasulullah is in Medina. Surah at tawbah is revealed. This is a declaration of immunity, a declaration of war because, of, because the polytheists violated the terms of their pact with the Holy Prophet. Surah at tawbah is revealed and it is given to Abu Bakr to go and make the announcement. Now, when he reaches Dhul Hulayfa, which is one of the points of entry into the Haram of Mecca, Jibra'il comes to the Prophet and says, Ya Rasulullah, either you have to deliver this message or someone from you. La yuballighuha illa ant aw rajulun mink. And this is even mentioned in Sunni hadith literature. Now, there are some Sunni scholars that try to dismiss this narration. They say, oh, it's not authentic. But there's no denying that this is an authentic narration. Some of them say that, oh, this was, they try to downplay and water down this fadila of Amir al muminin by saying that, oh, this was, you know, part of the Jahili system, the tribal system, where if you want to make a declaration of war, it has to come from someone who's of your direct family. In any case, there's no doubt that this is a command from Jibra'il. This has nothing to do with the, the Arab customs. Amir al-Mu'mineen is sent by the Holy Prophet because he's the only one who can represent the Prophet. The Quran calls him the nafs of the Prophet So he goes and he takes this message from Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr is sent back. Amir al-Mu'mineen enters Mecca and he recites the verses of Bara'a and he makes a few announcements to the mushrikeen of Mecca who are in Mecca. Number one, and this is mentioned even in a hadith from Imam al-Baqir where he says that Anir al-Mu'mineen made four announcements in Mecca. The first is that tawaf with nudity is forbidden. Now you may wonder, my dear brothers and sisters, that is this real? Did people in the era of the pre-Islamic era, did they really do tawaf around the Kaaba naked? And if they did, why did they do that? What's the reason? It's, it's a very odd practice. Why would anyone do tawaf in public with their clothes off? Now, as you know, brothers and sisters, Hajj as a religious ritual was known to the Arabs. In fact, the Arabs took pride in the fact that they traced their ancestry back to Ibrahim alayhis salam. Many of them took pride in this. Ibrahim was a very respected figure among the Arabs. And therefore, the Hajj rituals were carried out generation after generation. And the Arabs believed that anyone who comes to Mecca, because many of the neighboring tribes, they would descend upon Mecca and they would perform Hajj. The Arabs believed that when you arrive in Mecca, you have to donate the clothes on your back in charity. Either you give the clothes off of your back or you give the monetary value of your clothes in charity. So many of the Arabs, when they would arrive in Mecca, 
they would give their clothes that were on their backs in charity and they had a new set, they had another set of clothing that they would wear to perform Hajj. So as soon as you arrive in Mecca, whatever you're wearing has to be given in charity or the monetary value of it needs to be given. And therefore the Arabs used to do this. Now in certain cases, some people would arrive in Mecca and they only had the clothes on their back and they had no extra clothing and they did not have any money to give in charity that was equivalent there was the monetary equivalent of their clothes and no one was willing to lend them any clothing so what happened from time to time especially among the more poor uh pilgrims they ended up just removing their clothes because they they were not allowed to perform hajj with the clothes on their backs because those that clothing had to be given in charity so in many cases people ended up doing tawaf naked because they did not have an extra pair of clothes no one was willing to lend them and they were too poor to give the monetary value of that clothing in charity and in one in in, in a few cases even some women they would come to mecca they were poor so they found themselves in this dilemma and they took the clothes off of their backs and they did tawaf completely naked can you imagine this happening in mecca so amir al-mu'mineen alayhi salam he says this practice of doing tawaf naked is forbidden under no circumstance is anyone allowed to do this now this was number one number two amir al-mu'mineen alayhi salam he says that the mushrikeen who have a peace treaty with the Prophet and they did not violate their treaty with the Prophet and their treaty lasts for two three five or ten years Rasulullah will honor that truce with you number three Amir al-Mu'mineen he says that those who don't have any agreement with the Prophet they have no treaty with the prophet they have no social contract with the prophet these mushrikeen amir al mu'mineen on behalf of the prophet on behalf of the quran says you have a four month grace period you either become muslim or we go to war and you have four months to make up your mind and if at the end of four months war begins and then number four, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he says that the mushrikeen, the polytheists, are not allowed to participate in hajj after this year. So you're talking in the ninth year after the hijrah. And nor are they allowed to enter the haram of Mecca, not just the sacred mosque, but the entire sanctuary of Mecca. Now, with the revelation of Surat at Tawbah, Mushrikeen are no longer allowed to enter the Haram. So Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, innama al-mushrikoona najasoon. Allah says, O you who believe, the idolaters are surely unclean. And because of this uncleanliness, and I'll explain what is the meaning of najas here. As a result of this najasa, of this uncleanliness, one of the practical implications of this impurity, this uncleanliness, is that they are not allowed to enter Masjid al Haram. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word najas. Innama al-mushrikuna najas. Now, the word najas is a word made up of three letters. Noon, jim, and seen. Najas, with a fatha on the noon and the jim. In Arabic, we have the word najas. And we have the word najis. 
Najis is different because there's a kasra on the letter jim. Now, what's the difference? The word najas is a masdar, meaning it's a noun from which verbs are derived. So it essentially means najasa. So a, a, a literal translation of innam al mu'minuna najas is that the idolaters are an uncleanliness. Now, just to give you an, a najis with a kasra means that it's an adjective describing them as being unclean. I'll give you a simple example. In Arabic, we have the word aswad. Aswad is an adjective, just like the word najis. Aswad, it means black. And we also have the word sawad, which means blackness. Which means blackness. We have the word abiyav, white. And we have the word bayav, whiteness. Now, what's the difference? The masdar, there's, it's a more intense description. Now, what does it mean when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the idolaters are unclean? Is the Quran speaking about a physical impurity or a spiritual impurity? Now, this has raised a lot of discussion. This has generated a lot of debate among the scholars. Some scholars, they look, some ulama of tafsir, they look at this ayah and they say that this ayah is evidence that mushrikeen, that kuffar, are najis. They're considered najis. They are one of the physical impurities. Now, other scholars that say, they say, no, this najasa is not a physical najasa. Because Allah says they are najis, they are najis, and because they are najis, they are not allowed to enter Masjid al Haram. Some of the ulama, like Ayatollah Bakr Irawani, he says, we have many examples of impure things, najasat, that we are allowed to take with us inside of the masjid, provided that that najasa does not spread. So for example, blood is najis, blood is impure. If I take a bottle of blood, a container of blood, and I take it inside of Masjid al-Haram, is this halal or is this haram? It's permissible. I'm allowed to take a bottle of blood, provided that I don't spill it anywhere, but if it's contained in this bottle, and I put it in my pocket, and I walk into Masjid al-Haram, no faqih says that this is problematic. It's permissible. So this is an example of a physical najasa entering into Masjid al-Haram, and there's no problem. So Ayatollah Baqir Irawani and some other fuqaha, they say that the najasa that is being ascribed to the idolaters is not a physical najasa, but rather it is a najasa al-ma'nawiyya. It is a spiritual impurity. Also because of the word innama. Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu innama al-mushrikuna najas. The word innama is a term that conveys exclusivity. Now if the ayah is talking about physical impurity, it doesn't make sense to say that a mushrik their physical reality is nothing but najasa. That doesn't seem like what the Quran is trying to convey. But rather, on a spiritual level, the reality of a mushrik is spiritual impurity. Now, a soul, now, so why is, so if someone is spiritually contaminated with shirk, 
Why does the Quran say they are not allowed to enter the sanctuary of Mecca? Brothers and sisters, in the same way, in the spiritual realm, in the same way, for example, the same way water does not mix with oil, a soul, a heart that is polluted with shirk cannot be put in an atmosphere like Mecca. Because the atmosphere of Mecca is an, at is an atmosphere of Tawheed. If you look at the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Mecca. There is a spiritual significance to this land, to this atmosphere. And that is, Allah says in Surah Ali Imran, Surah number 3, Ayah number 96, إِنَّ أَوَّلَ بَيْتٍ وُضِعَ لِلنَّاسَ لَلَّذِي بِبَكَّةَ مُبَارَكًا وَهُدًا لِلْعَالَمِينَ Indeed, the first house that was erected, that, is what, that was established for people, for the worship of the one true God, was Mecca. It's a blessed place. And it is a source of guidance for the alameen, meaning all of creation. This is, this Mecca, this sanctuary, this is the nucleus, the spiritual nucleus for all of creation. Meaning that this is the birthplace of Tawheed. And therefore those who have contaminated their souls with the great sin, of ascribing partners to the Lord of the worlds, in the same way water and oil do not mix, they are not to be, they are not allowed to enter into this atmosphere of Tawheed until they purify their hearts of shirk. And then Allah, in the last part of the ayah, He says to the mu'mineen, so, Ya ayyuhalladheena amin, O you who believe, إِنَّمَا الْمُشْرِكُونَ نَجَسٌ فَلَا يَقْرَبُونَ فَلَا يَقْرَبُوا فَلَا يَقْرَبُوا الْمَسْجِدَ الْحَرَامَ بَعْدَ عَامِهِمْ هَذَا They're not allowed to enter the sacred mosque after this year. And then Allah addresses the believers. وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ عَيْلَةً فَسَوْفَ يُغْنِيكُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ إِنْ شَاءَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ if you fear poverty, so Allah is telling the mu'mineen, if you fear poverty, God will enrich you from his bounty, if he wills. Truly God is knowing and wise. Now you may ask, what's the relationship between prohibiting mushrikeen from entering Mecca and the believers having a fear of poverty? As I mentioned, I think I maybe have mentioned this in our last session, that many believers, many of the mu'mineen, many of the sahaba, they had businesses in Mecca. And Mecca was a religious tourist destination, meaning people from all over the Arabian Peninsula and even beyond, they would visit Mecca. Muslims, non-Muslims, Jews, Christians, different people. And because now there is this new rule that the mushrikeen are barred from entering Mecca, some of the Sahaba were afraid that this is really going to damage my bank account. That now I'm going to lose maybe 75% of my customer base. Because even the, the mu'mineen, they were economically benefiting there was a financial benefit to having the mushrikeen come to Mecca. So now suddenly, maybe they didn't express it out loud, but some of the Sahaba are scratching their heads thinking then, what's going to happen to my business? So there's a fear of poverty now in the hearts of many of the Muslims. What does Allah say? If you fear poverty, فَسَوْفَ يُغْنِيكُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ Then Allah will enrich you. Don't worry. So this shows you, brothers and sisters, that 
These are Sahaba, these are companions of the Prophet, and they're worried about their businesses. After the death of the Prophet, you know, people they wonder how come so few, how come there were so few among the companions who stood beside Ali ibn Abi Talib? Habibi, they were afraid of, they were afraid to lose money. They're going to risk their lives to defend Islam alongside Ali ibn Abi Talib. They're going to risk having the illegitimate government that rose after the Prophet confiscate their properties. It required a lot of sacrifice to st stand with Ali ibn Abi Talib after the death of the Prophet. So many of the companions, they had this fear, this fear of poverty. And what's going to happen if, if the mushrikeen are banned from entering Mecca? Now, speaking of, of this idea of rizq, because essentially these are companions, these are Muslims who are afraid that their rizq is going to be constrained, that they're, they're going to miss their sustenance. They're going to miss out on their sustenance. Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi has a beautiful hadith reminding us that Allah, He is a raziq that Allah is the provider, that Allah is the sustainer. The Imam alayhi salam, he says, Inna Allah wassa'a arzaq al-hamqa liya'tabira al-uqala وَيَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ الدُّنْيَا لَيْسَ يُنَالُ مَا فِيهَا بِعَمَلٍ وَلَا حِيلًا Such a beautiful hadith. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he says that Allah has expand, he expanded the sustenance of fools. He has given them a lot of money. Have you ever met people who they don't, they don't, they're not the sharpest tools in the shed. They're not, you know, the brightest bulbs. But they're wealthy. They make a lot of money. And they do it lawfully. So they're, you know, I, I've even met businessmen. Wallah, brothers and sisters, they are illiterate. When I say they're illiterate, they literally, they cannot read or write. But he's a multimillionaire. Imam al-Sadiq says, Allah has enriched the foolish people, the fools, people who have very who are simpletons, who have very limited intellectual power, to remind the intelligent and the business savvy ones that this dunya cannot be attained only through action and through cunningness, meaning that it's in my hands. This is evidence that. Sustenance is on Allah's hands because if it was about intelligence and being shrewd and cunning, then only the intelligent and the sharp would be wealthy. The simpletons would be poor. But we meet in our lives a lot of people who are uneducated, who are not very intelligent, and Allah gives them wealth. And this is a reminder, this is proof. This is a lesson for us that Allah is the ultimate provider. If he wants to provide, he'll provide for the fool and he'll deprive the sharp, business savvy, intellectual. In another hadith from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, alayhi salatu was salam, he says, Inna Allah ja'ala arzaq al-mu'mineen من حيث لا يحتسبون وذلك أن العبد إذا لم يعرف وجه رزق كثر دعاء. Another beautiful hadith from the Imam. The Imam says Allah has placed the sustenance of believers in places that they do not anticipate. You know, in the تعقيب, the du'a after صلاة العشاء. The dua that is recommended after Salatul Isha is about how we don't know where Allah has placed our rizq. Is it in the land, in the sea? We don't know. And the Imam says Allah has intentionally concealed the sources of our sustenance because 
Because when we don't know the sources of our sustenance, we increase in dua. The fact that we don't know, you know, when you lose your job, you don't know where your sustenance is going to come from, how you're going to pay your bills, who's going to hire you. The, that, that ignorance is the reason why you're always making dua. Because if Allah, if you knew that your rizq is going to come from this source, perhaps you will reduce how much you supplicate to Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to always be connected to him. So he hides and he conceals the sources of your sustenance so you can intensify your supplications and be frequent in your prayers to him. Ayah number 29. Allah says, قَاتِلُوا الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَلَا بِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَلَا يُحَرِّمُونَ مَا حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَلَا يَدِينُونَ دِينَ الْحَقِّ مِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ حَتَّى يُعْطُوا الْجِزْيَةَ عَنْ يَدٍ وَهُمْ صَاغِرُونَ Allah says, fight those who do not believe in God and the last day and do not forbid what God and His Messenger have forbidden and who do not follow the religion of truth among them those who were given the book till they paid the jizya with a willing hand being humbled now in order us in order for us to understand the context of this verse so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is now speaking about ahlul kitab when there is conflict with the people of the book now, some of the Mufassireen, they say that this verse is related to the expedition of Tabuk, the Battle of Tabuk. The battle never actually took place, the expedition of Tabuk. And very briefly, for those of you who are not familiar with Tabuk, the expedition of Tabuk, after Fath Mecca, after the conquest of Mecca, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, sent a letter to the Roman Emperor. So this was after the eighth year after the Hijrah. Mecca is conquered. Rasulullah begins writing letters to the neighboring rulers. He writes a letter to the Roman Emperor and the Prophet sends one of his companions, Harith ibn Umayr, as an ambassador to deliver the letter to the Emperor of Rome. The Emperor of Rome receives the letter and probably rips up the letter and executes the ambassador. Now, even in modern times, killing an ambassador is a declaration of war. So the Romans kill the emissary of the Prophet, the ambassador. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi assembles an army of 3,000 Muslims and they go to the border to fight against the Romans. And this battle became known as the Battle of Mu'ta. And one of the military commanders in that battle was Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, the elder brother of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, who was actually martyred in that battle the muslims lost that battle now after the romans victory in the battle of mu'ta they were emboldened they thought to themselves that these muslims are weak we can probably crush them so they became emboldened by their victory in mu'ta that they decided to invade hijaz to invade the arab lands Rasulullah receives intelligence that Hijaz is going to be invaded by the Romans. And the Romans, of course, they were Christians, Ahlul Kitab. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi assembles an army even larger than Hunayn. Hunayn, they were 12,000, and that was the largest the Arabs had ever seen. 
30,000 Rasulullah assembles and and this is the only time where the Prophet commands Ali ibn Abi Talib to stay behind. Because as we will see later on in this verse, the Munafiqeen are planning to overthrow the Prophet's government in his absence. The, the Munafiqeen, and many of them were very prominent companions of the Prophet. They were among the ranks of the Muslims. So when Rasulullah notices that some of the Munafiqeen are staying behind and they're not joining in the expedition to Tabuk, Rasulullah appoints Ali ibn Abi Talib to stay behind. Amir al-Mu'mineen, of course, being the flag bearer, being the hero in all of the battles, Amir al-Mu'mineen was heartbroken. Some of the other companions began to taunt Ali ibn Abi Talib that, look, oh Ali, if you had any value in the eyes of Rasulullah, he wouldn't leave you in Medina with the women and the children. They started to mock Ali ibn Abi Talib. So the Imam alayhi salam, he comes to the Prophet, he says, Ya Rasulullah, why are you not allowing me to join you? Why are you leaving me behind? And this is when the Prophet, this is among the many times where the Prophet says, Ya Ali, ama tarva an takuna minni bi manzilati Haruna min Musa. Oh Ali, don't you want to be to me as Harun was to Musa? You're the only one that can keep this mutiny under control in my absence. You're the only one who can deal with these munafiqeen in my absence. So the Prophet, he leaves Amir al muminin Now, it's important for us brothers and sisters, and this ayah, ayah number 29, is a reminder that we cannot treat all of Ahlul Kitab the same. There are some Jews and Christians, and this, this takes a lot of, this takes wisdom and discernment on the part of the Muslims. You know, there are some who are naive. They think that everyone is a friend of the Muslim community. There are Jews and Christians who are friends of the Muslim community. But there are also others who are extremely hostile. And they are so hostile that they are willing to have a military conflict, to engage in military conflict with the Prophet. So it's important for us to distinguish the Ahlul Kitab who are the friends of the Muslim community and members of Ahlul Kitab who are hostile towards the Muslim community. So for example, in the Quran, there are many ayat in the Quran where Allah praises Ahlul Kitab, some members of Ahlul Kitab. If you go to Surah Ali Imran, ayah number 113 and 114, verses 113 to 115, Allah says in ayah number 113 of Surah Ali Imran, Allah says, Laysu sawa'an. After Allah mentions, the crimes of Bani Israel and how they used to kill the messengers and the prophets, Allah says they're not all the same. Some of them are wicked. Some of them are murderers. They are the murderers of the prophets. But there are among the Ahlul Kitab, Laysu sawa'an min Ahlul Kitab, ummatun qa'imatun yatluna ayatillahi ana al-layl wa hum yasjudun. Allah says, Laysu sawa. They're not all the same. From among the people of the book, min ahlil kitabi ummatun qa'imatun. Among the people of the book is an upright community who recite God's signs in, while they are in prostration. So Allah says there are some among ahlul kitab who perform a type of salatul layl. They wake up in the night and they worship and they prostrate. Allah says there are some members among the people of the book who are so righteous that they sacrifice their sleep and they do ibadah at night. They prostrate. يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ They believe in God and they believe in the hereafter, in the day of judgment. وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ They enjoin good. 
They forbid evil. They're active in their communities. They are social justice advocates in their communities. Allah is describing some of the people of the book, some of the Jews and the Christians. Allah says some of them are so pious that they sacrifice their sleep to worship. They enjoin good, they forbid evil, and they hasten towards that which is good. When there's an opportunity to do good, they are among the first ones. Allah says, these are righteous people. They are salihin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and whatever good they do, they shall not be denied. Allah says, I'm not going to ignore the good that they do. Many of them just did not have access to the pure Islam of Ahlul Bayt. But they did good. They lived righteous lives. And Allah says their good will not be ignored. So you see some verses, Allah praises them. And another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah 5, verse 82, Allah says, وَلَتَجِدَنَّ أَقْرَبَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّا نَصَارًا Allah says, to the Muslims, to the Prophet, that you will find that the ones who are closest to the Mu'mineen, they are the most inclined in kindness and in gentleness towards the believers, are the ones who say, we are Christians. Why? Allah says, because among the Christians, are priests and monks who are humble. Allah says they don't have any takabbur in their hearts. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises many of the members of Ahlul Kitab. But we shouldn't be naive. Some of the Ahlul Kitab, their actions indicate that they don't believe in God. They don't believe in the hereafter. وَلَا يُحَرِّمُونَ مَا حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ And they have changed their sharia. They do not forbid what God has forbidden. They have adulterated the teachings of Isa and Musa. When you fight against them, you fight against them until they pay the jizya. Now, in wartime, if the enemies are mushrikeen, if they're not Ahlul Kitab, there are only two options. We fight or you become Muslim. This is how the Prophet dealt with the mushrikeen. They did not have any other option. If you go to war with us, we either fight you or... If you want protection, the only way for you to be protected is that you become Muslim, and that's it. But when there is military conflict with Ahlul Kitab, there are three avenues. We fight, you become Muslim. If you don't want to be Muslim, you have a third option. You retain your religious identity as Christians and in Jews, and you pay an indemnity, you pay a jizya. Now the word jizya comes from the word jaza. And this is something that is being paid in exchange for their wealth and their lives to be protected. And also when they pay this jizya, which is a type of tax, they are protected under the Islamic government. Meaning that if Muslim lands are invaded, they are not required to join the military. They don't fight. The Muslims fight on their behalf. So this jizya is paid and they're allowed, they're given a certain degree of autonomy to their own affairs. 
And in exchange for this indemnity, they are protected. And they are not required to pay any other tax. They don't pay zakat, they don't pay khums. They pay this jizya, and this jizya affords them full protection. It is now the responsibility of the Muslim state to protect this religious minority. Now the Quran says, mentions something about the way that this jizya is paid. Allah says, Hatta yu'atul jizyata an yadin wa hum sagirun. That they are to give. So Allah says, fight those. So I'll read the entire ayah just for the sake of, so we have a, the complete concept. In number, ayah number 29, Allah says, fight those who do not believe in God and the last day and do not forbid what God and his messenger have forbidden and who do not follow the religion of truth among those who were given the book till they pay. So fight them. And the only time you can stop fighting them is, is either they become Muslim or they pay jizya. They pay this indemnity till they pay the jizya with a willing hand being humbled. Hatta yu'atul jizyata an yadin. An yadin here means when this indemnity is collected each individual has to pay this jizya, meaning that they can't send someone on their behalf. Every single person has to pay this indemnity, and it cannot be deferred. They cannot say, oh, I'll pay you next year. They have to pay it. It has to be paid an yadin, immediately. So it should be paid directly without an intermediary and without delay. Now, what does it mean when it says, and they should be humbled? An yadin wa hum sagirun, from the word sigha, to be made humble. Now, many medieval commentators of the Quran misunderstood this verse. And there are even some Shia scholars who have this opinion, but it doesn't seem like it's consistent with the spirit of Islam. They say that when the Muslims collect this indemnity from Ahlul Kitab, they have to receive payment in a way that humiliates the person who's giving it. And that is, for example, the, the Muslim who's collecting it has to be standing while the person, the, the Ahlul the Kitabi who's paying it has to be sitting. But this is not compatible with the spirit of Islam. Islam does not want to humiliate people and disgrace them and take away their honor. The reality is that the very fact of paying the indemnity is tantamount to this idea of being humbled. Now, you may ask me, how, how do we know that jizya is not to be taken from mushrikeen, that this is a special concession that is granted to Ahlul Kitab. There's a hadith where the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was fighting against some of these mushrikeen and the mushrikeen refused to convert to Islam and they did not want to fight and they wanted to pay the Prophet jizya because the Prophet saw, because they, they asked, let us pay jizya. So these mushrikeen requested to pay jizya. And they tell the Prophet that, and the Prophet says, jizya is only for Ahlul Kitab. These mushrikeen, they said to the Prophet, but you took jizya from the Majus, from Zoroastrians. Rasulullah, and, and these, these mushrikeen, are arguing with the Prophet saying that Majus, Zoroastrians are not Ahlul Kitab and yet you took from them. Rasulullah corrects their misconception. Zoroastrians are Ahlul Kitab. Rasulullah says that in al Majus, the Prophet explains to them that I took jizya from Zoroastrians because they are Ahlul Kitab. 
Rasulullah says, Inna al majusa kana lahum nabiyun faqatalu. That the Zoroastrians had a prophet. A prophet was sent to them. His, his name, according to some traditions, was Zoroaster. Faqatalu. They killed him. And this is the story with almost all of these prophets, these ma'sumin. Allah sends these emissaries, these guys, and the people, they kill them. فَقَتَلُوا إِنَّ الْمَجُوسَ كَانَ لَهُمْ نَبِيٌّ فَقَتَلُوا وَكِتَابٌ أَحْرَقُوا So Allah sent a prophet to their Zoroastrians, and they also had a book. Just like the Jews have Tawrat, and the Christians have Injil, the Zoroastrians had a book. What did they do with the book? They burned it. They burned the book. So, you know, the Christians and the Jews, they they did tahrif. They distorted their books. The, the Zoroastrians didn't distort it. They burned it. They burned all of it. Atahum nabiyuhum bi kitabihim fi ithna ashara al fijildi thawr. That this book that was given to the Zoroastrians through their prophet had 12,000 pages. It was a very, very large book of revelation. Now, as I mentioned, that paying this jizya provided protection to the Ahlul Kitab, they were not required to participate in jihad, and they were also not required to pay zakat or khum. So in exchange for this jizya, they were granted protection under the Islamic State. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi al-tahireen. If there are any questions or comments, uh, it seems like the verses qualifying um, the which Christian Kitab should be fought against, and it also says that like um, the ones who do not uh, forbid what Allah has forbidden and things along those lines. So is this implying that there were other Christians and Jewish people or Jewish tribes at the time? who were not uh, required to pay jizya because they were potentially doing things properly according to their books? Now, <clears throat> many of the mufassireen, they believe that this jizya applies to all of Ahlul Kitab who are living in Muslim territory. That, now of course the ones who are hostile they're fought, and if they decide that they don't want to fight anymore, jizya is taken from them. But even the Christians and the Jews who are peaceful, they are still required to pay a jizya. Now this jizya is because in an Islamic state, they're not, there's no obligation on them to participate in jihad. So because they are exempt from jihad, so this paying this jizya means that they're exempt from jihad. And this jizya is essentially a social contract with Ahlul Kitab that now you are now that you are living in Muslim territory, you have to contribute to the Islamic state. You have to be a taxpayer. You know, Muslims pay zakat and khums. You're not you're not going to get a free ticket. You have to pay your fair share. And one of the most important expenses is defense that you have to contribute towards defense and when you pay jizya part of the agreement is that you are not allowed to support the enemies of islam so not offering support to the enemies of islam and being exempt from jihad and being protected by the muslim community is a benefit that is afforded to to uh, the Christians and the Jews and the Zoroastrians. So even if they are not hostile, by virtue of living in an Islamic state, they have to pay a certain tax. There's no, you can't just live for free and 
You know, Muslims are putting their lives on the line so you can live in, uh, in, a, in a place that is safe and secure. You also have to contribute. And do you know about how much the jizya would usually be or what, what that amount was? So I anticipated that this question was going to be asked. And I anticipated the question was going to come from Zayn too. So I actually, there's a hadith where someone actually asks Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam the exact question that, that Zayn asked. How much is to be taken? Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he says there is no specific amount. The amount is determined by the Imam. Which means that if it's a wealthy person, they have to pay a higher, a higher uh, amount than a poor person. Now, when we say that they have to pay a jizya, are we talking about just a few quarters in their pocket, a small amount that they don't feel it? Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he, he speaks about this idea of being humbled. So the ayah said, that they have to give jizya hatta yu'ta jizya ta'an yadin wa hum saghirun. They have to give it this indemnity with a willing hand being humbled. Saghirun. Imam al-Sadiq, he says that, he says, فَالْجِزْيَةُ تُؤْخَذُ مِنْهُمَ عَلَىٰ قَدْرِ مَا يُطِيقُونَ لَهُ That the jizya has to be an amount that they are able to pay but it's an amount that is hefty enough that it makes them consider converting to Islam to avoid paying it. So the Imam says that it should be an amount that they can handle. So you can't, the jizya cannot be more than the person has. It has to be something that they are able to pay. But the Imam says, وَكَيْفَ يَكُونُ صَاغِرًا وَهُوَ لَا يَكْتَثِرُ لِمَا يُؤْخَذُ مِنْ The Imam says, how can they be considered صَاغِرٌ humbled if the amount that they give is not deemed a lot in their eyes? So it has to be a tax that is heavy enough to really make them feel it, that, that wow, that was a lot of money that they took. To make them consider you know, maybe we should just we should just be Muslims and not pay this heavy tax. Now, you may say that you know, then they're not converting to Islam with sincerity. That's between them and Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. At the end of the day, Muslims are fighting in the battlefields and they're putting their lives at risk to to ensure that the Jews and the Christians are living safely in the Islamic Empire. So the tax that you have to pay has to be a significant amount. So it should be something that they can afford, but not something that's so minimal that it's like a rounding error that, okay, yeah, here, take your few dollars and leave me alone. That it should be an amount that makes them consider converting to Islam. Because they because khums and zakat maybe would be less for them. Does that answer the question? Uh, yes, thank you. So it's subjective to, to you know to, to make the uh, answer pretty short and simple. It's subjective and it's it's decided by the Imam, by the Ma'soom. And uh, and some Ayatollah Sheikh Nasr Makarim al Shirazi also believes that jizya is only paid by only the males who are at an age where they can actually fight in the battlefield. So it's not taken from women or children or the elderly. It's taken, this is Sheikh Nasr Makar Mishirazi's opinion, that it's only taken from able-bodied men who could fight in the battlefield, but they paid the jizya to be exempt from fighting in the battlefield. Almost sounds like this is a way to kind of incentivize people to hear, come join our battles or come join our army. Yeah, could be. Also, uh, in the battle where Imam Ali was left behind in Mecca, uh, it seems like uh, he, uh, he was heartbroken and everything. Why did he not know why he was left behind? 
why why he was being left behind uh why did he have to go why was he upset not ha and have to go ask the prophet about why he's being left behind um ignoring the bit of uh, the ilm al ghaib aspect if someone's being strategically left behind to foil a plot then you would expect them to be told here's why you're being left behind and here's what i'm expecting you to do now it's important for us to understand that the imams alim was salam the prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who inherently possesses knowledge of the unseen. That's why in the Quran you have certain verses that say only Allah knows the ghayb. And then you have other verses that give exceptions. You know, there are, you know, illa min rtaba min rasul. There are those who are granted knowledge of the unseen. And this is why Imam Amir al Mu'mineen he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ilmul ghayb. And what we, the Ahlul Bayt, have is ta'allumul ghayb. We have acquired knowledge of the unseen. Allah possesses knowledge of the unseen while we have acquired it. And one of the ways that Amir al Mu'mineen acquires knowledge of the unseen is through the Prophet. So the Prophet, prior to this moment, Amir al Mu'mineen probably didn't know. And this ilm al ghayb was given to Amir al Mu'mineen through the Prophet. And this is why Amir al Mu'mineen himself he says, Allamani Rasulullah al fababin min al ilm. Yuftahuli min kulli bab alf al bab. That the Prophet taught me. And of course, Allah taught the Prophet. So uh, the Prophet taught me 1,000 doors of knowledge. Each door opens up 1,000 more doors. So there's no problem in saying that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib did not know what the strategy was until the Prophet revealed to him. Very simple. And it's not that he was protesting, he just wanted to know that, you know, I, I've been a participant in every battle. So there's, you know, sometimes you question to object, but other times you question to understand. And Amir al Mumin was questioning the Prophet to understand, to know. What, what is the reason I'm being left behind? Not because he was, you know, uh, protesting what the Prophet had asked him. So this ilm al ghayb was given to Amir al Mu'minin through the Prophet. Uh, and uh, so, why do you think, uh, do you have any thoughts on why he wasn't told about why he was being left behind at the part of the initial command? Like when he found out that, hey, you're not being left behind, why wasn't he told that, hey, here's the mission that you're supposed to fulfill instead you know Allah knows best but my understanding is that not telling Amir al muminin from the onset prompted him to ask this question in a public setting whereby the Prophet tells he doesn't go into details but he met he makes the famous statement don't you want to be to me as Harun was to Musa so it seems that the Prophet was also strategic when it came to when and how to reveal things to Ali ibn Abi Talib to basically to allow for a larger audience to hear about the unique relationship that the Prophet had with Ali ibn Abi Talib. Because if he told him privately, Rasulullah would have never, you know, the, it, the, the, the question of Amir al Mu'minin being the being to the Prophet as Harun was to Musa would have never been brought up in a public setting, in an organic way at least. Also, um, we talked earlier about how Mecca is the spiritual hub uh, for Muslims. How does that apply in today's world where al Saud is controlling Mecca? You know, al Saud. It, it, you know, it's it's like it's 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 like the, it's the same thing as asking, you know, about Bani Umayyah and Bani Abbas. So things really haven't changed. You know what we're seeing today with Al Saud controlling Mecca. It's exactly what, like when Bani Umayyah was controlling Mecca and Bani Abbas was controlling Mecca. And this is what happens, brothers and sisters, when Muslims. Abandon their responsibility of Amr bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar. When Muslims don't enjoin that which is good 
and they don't forbid that which is evil, the natural consequence is that the most wicked among you will rule over you, and then you will supplicate to Allah, and Allah will not answer your dua. People like Ali Saud don't come into power unless the Muslims are not fulfilling their religious responsibility. We have 1.5 billion Muslims around the world, but most of them, they're just Muslims by name, and they turn a blind eye to the injustices, they turn a blind eye to the atrocities. As long as I have food on my table and money in my bank account, I don't care what happens in the Muslim world. You know, we have to develop the sense of responsibility. You know, Muslims have to be united. This Amr bil Ma'ruf wa Nih al Munkar is so significant that when it's abandoned, this is when you see the Yazids and the and the Al Sauds of the world ascend the throne. So it's and and, and this and this this is going to continue probably until the Zuhur of the Imam. My my feeling is that you know the fact that the you know qatlun nafsu zakiya the murder of the innocent soul and we don't know who this personality is will be slaughtered between maqam ibrahim and the kaaba 15 days before the zuhur of the imam this shows you that mecca will be unstable this region of the world will be unstable up until the zuhur of the 12th imam so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among the Ansar of the 12th Imam and to be among his inner circle so that when he makes his announcement of his reappearance between Maqam Ibrahim and the Kaaba, inshallah, will be at his service.